um, it's just uh, it's two more minutes to see if everyone is here. So let's let's start. Uh, good morning again. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, the do's and don'ts of health data science. Um, this lecture is actually split into two parts. Uh, the second part was meant to be a more practical session. Uh, however, due to these uh, constraints, so I, I had to to slightly change the, the focus and so we'll have more a chat and interactive chat about uh, data science in health research and some controversies in health data science and of course you will free you'll be free to 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 ask questions and i'll be asking you some questions as well so um uh, hopefully this will be a, a nice interaction with uh uh um uh, the topic being addressed as uh, the best as we can. Um, so, first of all, um, just a bit of presentation. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Pedro Pereira Rodriguez. I'm uh, uh, educated in machine learning. I have my PhD on big data science. Uh, I've been working in the uh, last 12 years in the medical uh, uh, school at Porto. I'm uh, currently the director of the PhD program in health data science, and I'm also investigator at Synthesis uh, in the thematic line <clears throat> of health data and decision sciences and information technology. Um, so my idea for this uh, lecture today is to make you understand the role and pitfalls of data science in health research with some anecdotal examples and uh, with some uh, discussion on some controversies that we found out when uh, trying to apply the usual data science process to health data. So just a, a quick start on data science. Of course, uh, most of you are well aware of, of what data science is, but just to make everybody the same ground. Um, data science is a study on creation, validation, transformation of data to generate meaning. And this is the most important part, is that we want to generate meaning from data. And usually this data is in its raw form. So we need to actually give it some context in order to generate meaning. And this has been done in the past uh, from uh, historical uh, research or John Kepler, uh, actually in health uh, area, John Snow and David Sachs, Sackett was actually, were actually pioneers in the area of giving meaning to data and transforming it into um, actionable knowledge. So this is some, uh, an area that has been around for, uh, for a long time now. Um, the fact is that there is a lot of uncertainty in clinical decision analysis and um, the consequences are usually uncertainty, so uh, uncertain. So the fact that we, even if we know a lot about some disease, uh, we might not know if the actual decision that we want to uh, provide to the patient it will be the best one, and we can generalize the knowledge to that patient. And this is why um, uh, evidence-based medicine came into practice. Uh, where we want to, to combine the personal clinical experience uh, uh, with the best external clinical evidence from quality clinical research and also the values and needs and expectations of uh, each patient. And the problem is that 
we, we need to find, if you want to help in this decision, we need to, to find exactly where the uncertainty is. And of course, the personal clinical experience is rather uncertain because it will be dependent on one single individual. Also, um, the values, the needs, expectations, and the individual context of each patient will be uh, uh, really uncertain if you want to generalize the decision because it will depend a lot on whom you are trying to help at a precise moment. So usually we focus on the clinical evidence from quality clinical research as the less uncertain uh, um, uh, piece of evidence to use in evidence-based medicine. So usually what we do is to, uh, is to look at a clinical practice which generates information that is used in research that, to generate knowledge. And this is the usual process of uh, a clinical study, for example. But then what we want to do is to apply this knowledge to, pa to patients, generating a decision that is used in practice. And this way we're closing the loop. The problem is that this loop usually takes a long time. So this is where data science can be helpful. If you look at these three uh, uh, points uh, of this triangle, you can see that the, the evidence-based medicine uh, is directly connected with this information cycle because you have the practice that comes from the experience of the clinician and research that is done using this data and the application to a specific patient. So where can data science be involved here? Uh, usually you will have, for example, processes of data management uh, uh, in the beginning and um, then a whole process of knowledge discovery that will take you from information to knowledge. But then you also need to think of how to represent this knowledge, how to make inference to particular patients and how to transform this into recommendations that can be used in practice. Usually this lower part of the cycle is uh, uh, the basis of clinical decision support systems. And this is where you usually want to reduce the uncertainty of the decision. So you have a, a decision and it needs to be uh, uh, made, made and uh, you need to take knowledge and try to, uh, and the uncertainty that is surround, surrounding this situation and transform it into a, a, a clinical decision. But the most important part from our point of view, from the point of view of data science, is actually how to formalize the uncertainty, how to look at the data and extract the meaning that will tell us where the uncertainty is so that we can tackle this, um, these problems. And a simple example could be, for uh, imagine you have an historical data set with clinical factors and you want to select the most relevant for predicting a certain outcome. Uh, for example, the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea, and you can look at the, this from different strata of women versus men or uh, with normal people with normal BMI versus people with, uh, which are obese. And you can look which factor is, seems more important. And then you combine this expert with expert knowledge and you define a small set of factors and then you do your actual clinical study to confirm your initial hypothesis. So uh, data science will be most relevant in the, in the first part of this cycle. Um, but usually what we end up having in the data science process is something like this. So you've got access to a medical database and coming from the machine learning area like I did, this would be uh, uh, the, best, the best scenario. Um, so I will put all my effort in applying my knowledge discovery process uh, using the state-of-the-art machine learning methods and validate on my models because I know that they need to be validated. You cannot just simply apply a model to the data and expect it to work. Um, and then present my results to the principal investigator or in the data, usually uh, the medical doctor uh, which, uh, who has the, the knowledge on the pro about the problem. Uh, but most of the time what we get uh, is that although the models seem nice, although they are um, apparently uh, good, um, there's still some resistance to use them. And why is that? And I use, usually use this example from this in 2014 was the first time I used this example and I still keep with, uh, keep with it because uh, it still happened uh, to the day. But why is this happening? Mainly they use, uh, uh, we found four arguments why most of our models that are generated from data science processes um, 
are hard to be transformed into uh, practice. Um, first of all, there's this uh, difficulty interpreting, interpreting the model in order to assess the validity. So we need to, to lose some of the most compl complex models and build some more explainable models. Um, also that there's no clear statistical support in machine learning models, and this is something that we need to still need to fight against because there's still this idea that only confirmatory uh, science, only uh, uh, studies that apply traditional frequency, frequency statistics will give you evidence and you need to uh, present more and more uh, support to your studies. But then you, you start getting to, into trouble when you get answers like the data you have used was not collected for that purpose. So we need to look into the protocol that generated the data so that we are pretty sure that we understand what the data is telling us. But sometimes the answer is just, I won't use it because the data is wrong. And this is something that we cannot work around. Even if we have all our efforts in making good data collection, you will get a lot of times problems with data being wrong because it has been collected for a different purpose. So the context in which the data is collected is most of the times the most important information and uh, the one that you don't have because this is uh, seldom uh, registered in the database. But is this really a problem? Um, of course, we know that you can only um, uh, give meaning to data if you transform it into uh, information, giving it some context. But uh, isn't it simple? Aren't systems already uh, built to give us the context uh, of the data they are storing? Imagine that you have access to a clinical record where you have a variable labeled penicillin and you want to analyze this data. Um, what does this mean? What does this variable mean? Of course, you can have answers like this. Of course, it records whether the patient is allergic to or not to penicillin, but does it really mean that? Or does it mean that the patient was tested for, an, uh, 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 for being allergic to penicillin, or the patient has just uh, had a shot of penicillin? So it's, it's hard to just look at the data and understand what it means. Um, and this has, uh, can have some serious consequences. For example, this is a simple example where we monitored the, the incidence of ischemic myocardial infarction over the years in all Portuguese uh, hospitals. And, and this, this study is uh, already some time, but this happens to, today as well. Uh, and we saw that there was this increase over, over time of this uh, um, um, of the incidence, of, and this was worrying for us. Of course, something that we did not know, and we knew afterwards, was that around 2004, there was a change in the protocol. And so uh, physicians were told to change the way they were coding the disease. Instead of using the previous three codes that they could use, they should uh, only use one of them. And so, of course, in 2008, when we did this, the code that uh, physicians should use was this one. So what we saw looking to the past was this increase in incidence. But this was actually an artifact due to a change in protocol that we could not be aware of unless we, we, uh, knew, we knew the people that were involved in the changes of protocol. And there, there are so many different examples of this, and, uh, and some of them are not uh, easily grasped by someone that has simply wants to do data science and wants to analyze data. For example, we, want to, we wanted to, to see if all radiology reports that were generated in a hospital were visualized by someone. So if someone asked for an X-ray or a CT scan, did they look at the report afterwards? And we saw this, and of course we separated this in terms of consultation of inpatient stays and emergency encounters. And we look at the survival curve. So how much, uh, how long did uh, that particular report take until it was seen by someone after being produced? And what we saw was rather disturbing because of course in consultations, we, we could expect 
that um, reports are only seen a few days after they are um, uh, produced uh, due to the calendar of uh, having different consultations. Uh, during inpatient stays, of course, during the first six to seven days, you will have some visualizations, then you stop having visualizations. But in emergency encounters, you could see that after one or two days, if a report was not seen, then it would not be seen uh, at all. And this was rather disturbing because this, what this mean, meant was that 45% of all the reports uh, generated in emergency encounters was not, were not being seen. And so um, this would be an actual problem to the, to the system, to the health system, uh, because we were, we're uh, uh, spoiling resources in making all these reports. However, what we found out is that, in fact, they were being accessed, but using a different information system, which was out of protocol. So we, will, we would never be aware that people were, were actual, actually looking at the report outside the system that they were meant to use. So when we look at the data, we saw this missing information there. We could infer that people were not looking at the, at the, at the reports, but this was just because people were not following the protocol as they should. And this happens more often than you could imagine. So if you look at the data, you should never assume that that data was generated by a specific protocol and that humans follow that protocol exactly. And this is the, the, the main message that you could uh, get from these problems with data in, in healthcare uh, situations. Of course, these are, uh, well, visualization of reports is, is something that uh, is, is quite specific, but these types of problems occur on also where simple, simpler data is, is uh, analyzed. And of course, this is just a toy anecdote for, for you to understand, but imagine that you wanted to, to uh, see the frequency of a, pa a patient's birthday by the day of the month. Okay, so you just want to know if a, 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 a patient's uh, birthday is on the first of the month or in the tenth of the month or so on. And we look to all hospital admissions in Portugal from 2000 to 2007, so all patients admitted to public hospitals in this period, and we look at the frequency of birthday by day of the month. And of course, we expected that this would be uniformly distributed. However, when we looked at the data, we saw that apparently birthdays were uh, uh, happening at multiples of five. And even adjusting for the final, for the final days of the month, um, this was clearly a pattern of multiples of five. And of course, there's no explanation for us to be being born at multiples of five of the calendar. And so there's something there that we could uh, not grasp looking at the entire data. But something uh, was uh, important to us is that this represented all the, the patients admitted uh, in those eight years. So in fact, we, we have people being admitted in this uh, period that were born uh, at the end of the 20th century but also at the beginning of the 20th century or even at the end of the 19th century. So was this a problem uh, connected to the actual birth dates of the patients and not exactly with a, a systematic problem? So we divided this into quarters of century and we saw that people that were born in the beginning of the, the 20th century, uh, century uh, in fact, still uh, presented this pattern of multiples of five with some uh, fluctuations. This was even more pronounced in uh, uh, the first uh, half of the uh, 20th century. Then uh, we, uh, it leveled up again uh, in the third quarter of the century. And finally, when you look only at patients that were born uh, at the end of the 20th century, the final quarter, we saw that the uniform distribution was there. And the only thing that changed over this period was 
in fact, the importance that people give to the birth date. Because in the beginning of the century, uh, registering someone to be to, to being born at the 20th or at the 21st or the 22nd was not relevant. Nowadays, no one is registered in the day different from that exact date where uh, they were born. Because we give more importance to this date. Well, the reasons can be uh, uh, manifold, but uh, the fact is that we give more importance to this uh, piece of information that we didn't give in the beginning of the century. So when you look at the, to the past, you will see that you're trying to give the same importance that we give today to data that was uh, collected 100 years ago, you will be in trouble because the importance that people gave at that moment to that specific uh, piece of information was much lower than the one that you're giving it to it uh, today when you're analyzing it. And this happens, of course, with birthdays. And this is not very relevant, but it happens with every piece of information. Remember the penicillin data. If it was registered in a situation where uh, being allergic to penicillin was not a really big problem, um, the quality of that data is not the same as if you are doing a research now, a study, where that particular variable is of uttermost importance. So this is a, another uh, extremely important message, is that if you're going to analyze data that is as the, by definition for data science retrospective and is uh, collected in the past, pay attention to what are the importance, what was the importance that people had back then gave to that specific information. And nowadays, with the pandemic of COVID-19, you have a perfect uh, uh, scenario where this will happen. Ten years uh, in the future, you will look at the data that is being collected today, and you will be seeing a shift uh, in uh, registering um, uh, frequencies of, data, of uh, variables because we are now giving a lot of information to some variables that usually don't have that information, that importance. For example, um, the, the losing of the smell sense, for example, is a very um, infrequent uh, symptom, but suddenly, because uh, it started appearing as uh, connected and associated with, uh, with uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2, then suddenly you will see a lot of uh, 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 health registers with this information there, whether if it is uh, yes or no. But most of the time, people wouldn't be even thinking of registering this uh, particular symptom. And so when looking back in time, even if you don't even know the protocol that was being in place, try to know exactly the importance that people were giving to the data. And so this is the main important uh, um, uh, message that you should take home when looking at the retrospective data, is data has a certain context, and most of all, there's an importance given by people who, who collect this data, okay? And the problem is that, well, you could say, now I have big data, so this will be all washed up but this will not happen. There are a lot of small data problems that occur also in big data, and they do not disappear because you, got, you have got a lot of stuff. They get worse, okay? So, main message for this uh, initial part is, if we're doing data science, we're looking to the past. If we're looking to the past, we, we need to know the protocol that collected the data, and the importance that was given to this data uh, collection uh, at the date where, uh, when it was collected, okay? So, of course, this is not solving anything because we know that we need to be aware, but we cannot solve it because this is already reg registered in the past. So, can we still do data science with this data or not? This is the, the second part of the lecture where I will be discussing some controversies on applying health data science um, using re this retrospective data.
if anyone has some question from this uh, initial part, then this would be a good time to, to put it in chat, in public chat, and I will try to answer it now or at the end of the session. Okay, so now that we have, well, this learning outcome was a, a, a bit uh, um, uh, overstated, of course, uh, we're still far from understanding the role and pitfalls of data science in health research, but in order to, to reach that point, I think we need to identify some controversy regarding the application of health data science. And we've been doing this in the past years um, because it's something that um, is not uh, uh, a clear, uh, there's not a clear definition of what we can or we cannot do in health data science. And you, you will see why. So, the use of data and information by medicine has generated many controversies even in the past. Remember how Francis Bacon's scientific method was uh, questioned? Uh, or even uh, John Snow's and David Sackett's uh, work were, were, were seen as something that was uh, completely uh, irrelevant or uh, even mocked. So nowadays we are dealing with the same issues. So we, are, uh, um, we have new debates on what we can do or we can't do. And there's always a, a, a faction of researchers that believe that we can go further and a faction of researchers that believe that we should be more aware and, and don't go uh, through this path. This path. Um, so um, let's start by making the best of it. So we have a lot of modern healthcare systems producing a wealth of data in electronic health records, administrative databases, clinical registers, and other clinical systems. Uh, it is widely acknowledged that there is a great potential for using this routinely collected data for health research. If we keep collecting data every day, then we will end up with a huge bunch of data that we could use for health research. However, this is not beyond debate. So the three controversies we'll discuss today are first, um, what has been called as the first law of medical informatics, which states that data shall be used only for the purpose for which they were collected. Then we'll discuss to which extent routine data sources and innovations in analytical methods alleviate the need to conduct randomized clinical trials. And finally, we will address questions of governance, privacy, and trust when routine health data are made available for research. So, controversy one. So, the question is, there's this strong statement that data shall be used only for the purpose for which they were collected. And you can understand why from the previous examples. So if data is collected for one purpose and you're trying to understand a different purpose from it, well, you might be in trouble. So even if you reuse data, you should uh, uh, be warned against using it uh, with secondary purposes because the context is different and you might misinterpret the importance of it. Uh, but before we discuss whether uh, this uh, um, is true or not, uh, I would like to hear about uh, from you. So I will ask you to join at slido.com and uh, give a, 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 on a scale, a rating from one to five, if you uh, agree or you don't agree, uh, with uh, the sentence. So with five meaning that you completely agree and one that you completely disagree. Okay, so I'll be uh, um, activating the poll. And you can start voting. And I'll give you a few minutes to vote on uh, slido.com.
Okay, so let's take a look at the voting. And okay, we already have 70 uh, votes, so I'll, I'll keep the voting open. But now let's look at, uh, at the results. And you can see that, well, you can see how um, uh, people are really uh, split. Uh, but some of you completely agree that that should be was only for purpose for which they were collected. And well, very few uh, completely disagree with the, with the question. But the fact is that uh, uh, because we, we are in um, debatable territory, it's expected, expected that you feel like that. But if you look closely, let's see why you should, uh, uh, you could agree or you could not agree or you could disagree with the, with the statement. First of all, let's see why you, uh, data should only be used for the purpose for which they were collected. For, there are large variations in the way primary care physicians use the HRs, for example. Some of uh, physicians uh, would rarely update the problem list while others would do it in the majority of encounters with patients. Um, so if you look at problem lists for diagnosis, you, you need to know what are the recording habits of each physician who created it. Also, you saw in the, in the first part of the lecture, there are some problems with the importance given to data, with diagnosing codes changing over time, with heterogeneity or non-adherence to data collection protocols, even rounded timestamps or uh, dates would make it uh, hard to understand what the data actually means. Um, but there are others, other sources of bias in data that make them uh, uh, not useful for research. The presence of recorded data for a given individual depends on the fact that that individual actually received services within the healthcare system. So, there are often individuals who do not use healthcare services, and this might be because of barriers to access or by preference, and this will bias the data that you will get from, uh, from them. So you cannot uh, reliably use this routinely collected data to derive information about population health, because there's a lot of information that will not go through the uh, health information systems. But now let's look at the bright side, why data should also be used for health research. There are some um, uh, evidence regarding the effectiveness of medical treatments that has been generated through RCTs, randomized controlled trials, with highly selected populations under tightly controlled conditions. Of course, that data that is routinely collected in the healthcare system are better sources to inform treatment decisions, as these decisions are made in the system that generated the data. So you're seeing the real world population that is seen in everyday clinical practice is not the tightly controlled conditions of some experimental uh, studies. Also, you're treated, this uh, data is treated under the same uncontrolled conditions. So there's no, um, uh, what you see in the routinely collected data is what actually happens in everyday uh, practice. Uh, and of course, this will help you create natural experiments between competing interventions from which we can learn which is most, most effective. Um, more than that, this creates the opportunity to analyze very large data sets with very long follow-up times against very low costs using this data to answer questions that will never be answered with additional studies. For example, uh, if you want to assess the cancer risk following exposure to low-dose ionizing radiation from diagnostic computed tomography scanning, um, you would never uh, be able to do an RCT for this, or uh, even a prospective study would take a long time. So, in a cohort of uh, all, uh, almost 1 million individuals in Australia, they managed to link electronic health records from the medical system to the Australian Cancer Database and the National Death Index. And they, they, they came up with, uh, with the association that um, explained that cancer incidence was found to be 24% greater in people exposed to CT scanning, even after accounting for age, sex, and year of birth. So, and this is some study that would not be uh, 
possible if you could not access data beyond its primary uh, purpose. Also, there are very um, uh, large data sets that not only can be used to assess safety and effectiveness of clinical procedures, but also to evaluate large-scale health policies. Okay? Imagine that um, this example of, uh, uh, if you want to assess the impact of UK smoke-free legislation that was introduced in July 2007 on perinatal survival. By leaking individual level data with death certificates for all registered singleton births in England over the time period between 95 and 2011, this will uh, allow to obtain a data set of 52,000 stillbirths and 10 million live births. And it was estimated that the first four years after the smoking ban, there were the, uh, uh, almost 1,000 stillbirths and 400, more than 400 neonatal deaths were prevented. And this could only be done by looking at this immense data set collected over a long period of time. So this is the main uh, um, uh, points in favor of doing uh, uh, reusing data beyond the purpose for which they were collected. But of course, you have the problems that you saw in the, uh, uh, in the beginning with the context of data and how you should use this data to uh, extrapolate information from, for, uh, for the population. And um, another example that you can have here is, and using the, the current situation, for example, using uh, um, data collected in um, uh, hospitals during this pandemic. Uh, you could look at this data and, th and think that, well, this is the only data that I'll be able to use to assess um, uh, severity of the disease or which symptoms are more associated or which pre uh, preconditions are more associated with a severe disease which leads to um, hospitalization and uh, eventually ICU uh, wards or even uh, death. Well, the fact is that you can only do this if you could have access to the data of all the infected uh, people that did not have access to the hospital uh, or to healthcare at all. And of course, in the beginning, and this is, uh, is um, quite different in different countries and in different regions of the same country, but you can have teams assessing and, and, and uh, assessing the epidemiological link and finding every, uh, doing the contact tracing and knowing everybody that is infected. Or you can simply have only access to the routinely collected data that is in uh, health information systems. And then if you look, uh, ten, in 10 years time, if you look to the past and look at the registers of the health information systems that are collected today at the hospital, you will see a, 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 a very strange skew on um, uh, uh, data distribution because a lot of services, a lot of uh, consultations and surgeries were completely cancelled and stopped. And so the entire data set is being completely transformed due to the specific context that we're living in. So it might be the only way we have to, to, to do our research, but it also has this problem of being completely uh, biased toward a certain context. And so this is why it is still a controversy. So there's no clear answer to that. And this is, of course, why we also understand why at the end of the voting, you, with more than 100 votes, we have most of, uh, uh, of respondents uh, were clearly undecided whether this is true or not. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, we are uh, reaching the, the end of the first part of the lecture, and so I would, uh, would like to take this time to take some uh, questions, uh, and then we will uh, see controversy two and three in the second part of the lecture after uh, 12. Okay?
Okay, so this is a very interesting question now. The, so the, the question is, uh, the context of using secondary data in this controversy is discussed only for data use in health research or research in general. Of course, I would say that this happens in uh, all types of, uh, all areas of research, because context is specific for certain uh, 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 data collection. And of course, uh, I would imagine that this also happens in other areas. Why I think this is a, a bigger problem in health research is because health and healthcare is much more uh, human dependent. So there's a lot of, of uh, areas of research, for example, in engineering or science, where everything is much more um, uh, uh, finely measured and doesn't have so much human interaction. A lot of data that is collected, even in, in uh, routinely collected data uh, uh, in, in healthcare, has a human intervention. You need more than, most of the times, more than one human being to collect the data, verify the data, and uh, give more information of the context of the data. And this is why I think that the problem of context is more uh, prevalent in health research than in other areas. So, uh, can we use data beyond the purpose collected? Uh, well, this uh, 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 question, uh, uh, the person that made this question said that this was not clear exactly. The, the, this is why it is a controversy. There's no clear answer to that. Of course, as we know, that in some, uh, uh, for some research questions, this is the only um, way we can do research. So there's no turn, uh, way around. We need to use the data to be able to, to answer some research questions. But we need to know the context in which the data was collected and preferably the protocol that made the data collection possible. If we don't know the protocol or we don't know the context or have an idea of the information or the, of the importance of this information, then it would be advised not to, to analyze the data. This is my, my uh, uh, personal feeling on that. And my, my recommendation is if you have access to a data set, if you have access to data, but you are not aware of how it was collected, what was the protocol, what was the context, uh, um, what was the importance given to pe uh, by people to that data, it makes no sense to analyze it because you will, you will be misleading your research. Now, how can we get consent of patients for using data in the secondary research? Well, this I will leave to the second part because one of the controversies, uh, the final one, is exactly regarding the concept, the consent of patients to, uh, to data use. So I will answer this in the, in the second part, okay? Okay. I don't know if there's uh, uh, any more questions. Uh, if there are no more questions, of course, if there are some more questions, I can answer it at the second part of the lecture. And now we can have a break and we'll be uh, together again at 12. Okay? See you in a minute. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 